you ever felt so beat up and so worn down by life that you hardly recognize yourself in the mirror? Have you ever felt like the essence of who you are as a human being is being worn down and exhausted because of the things going on in your own life or maybe in the world around you? If so, this is for you. It all started one day when my husband and I had taken a trip to the White Mountains. My first mistake was that I trusted a description that I had found on the internet. It said, Lonesome Lake, a short and sweet hike. Turns out there's a lot of words I would use to describe it, including beautiful, magnificent, magical, but the words I would not use would be short or sweet. The second mistake I made later the same day was when I decided that I could push my way through the exhaustion and go out to dinner anyway. So I'm sitting in the restaurant and I'm watching as people are eating their meals and they're laughing and they're smiling and I am on the brink of tears. And I thought to myself, I have never been this tired. But almost as soon as I had the thought, there was something that felt almost familiar and I started to ask myself, why, why is this feeling somehow familiar to me? And as I sat there, it occurred to me that there was actually a resemblance to the way that I felt in the weeks and months after my best friend had died by suicide. And I sat in it and I kept trying to place it. And I finally realized there's something similar, but this is different. This is a physical exhaustion. When she died by suicide, that, that was a soul exhaustion. And that was the first time that I had ever thought of this term, soul exhaustion. Full disclosure, other people have used the term, but when they talk about the soul, they're often talking about it in the context of the part of you that lives on beyond death. And being quite honest, I have no idea what happens when we die. So when I talk about the soul, what I'm talking about is the soul as the deepest part of who we are as a human being. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And then I started to recognize that I actually think I had spent the majority of my childhood experiencing soul exhaustion. And you might ask yourself, how could that possibly happen? How could a small child experience the exhaustion of the essence of who they are. The easiest way for me to explain this to you is that I was too much. I was always getting the message that I was too much. I was too impulsive, I was too fidgety, I was too slow to learn how to read, I was too eager to make friends, I was too likely to interrupt. In fact, I was so too much that my mother brought me to Boston Children's Hospital when I was seven and they determined that I had attention deficit disorder and other learning disabilities. And at the same time, while I was being too much, I was also being not enough. I wasn't pretty enough, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't, I didn't even have straight enough teeth. In fact, I was so not enough that even my father, who was a very bright man, he carried a Juris Doctor in law, even my father couldn't stay out of trouble for me. Even when he got released from prison, I wasn't enough for him to come home to. Shortly after he was released, he moved to an entirely different part of the state. Then he moved to an entirely different state. And then when I was about 13 years old, he moved out of the country entirely. And it was right about this time that I decided I was sick and tired of not being enough and being too much. And I accidentally became too much of something else. I became too intense. I became too assertive. I became too unpredictable, sometimes too self-destructive. And this trajectory did not change until I suddenly found myself sitting in the Dean of Admissions office at Holyoke Community College, another place my mother had dragged me to. And all of a sudden, I got new messages. This was my turning point. The Dean of Admissions looked at me and he said, even though you don't have a high school diploma or a GED, we think that you're smart enough to be able to benefit from the college experience. Soon after that, I got a new message. This one was really shocking. It was my report card. Usually, I tried to hide those. And this time, my report card said to me, you might actually be kind of smart. You have a 3.9 in your GPA, GPA in your major. And then maybe the most powerful message I got actually came from my peers when they looked at me and they said, we think that you're good enough to be the president of our psychology club. 
This was the launch pad for the rest of my life. Now, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't spend a lot of time reflecting on all of my childhood experiences, because I did. But I was forced to reevaluate them all when my father came home from South Korea. I knew that this time he was coming home to die, even if he didn't know that. And I had a decision I had to make. Was I willing to give him my emotional energy and my time, this person who had really hurt me terribly? And people around me were saying, he doesn't deserve that from you, Sarah. He hasn't earned that from you. And they may well have been right. But in my mind, it wasn't about what he deserved. It was actually about what I deserved. And I decided that I deserved to not live the rest of my life with regret. That I deserved to live by my own moral compass and be able to be proud of the decisions I had made. And so I decided that I would step up and I would help my brother and my sister-in-law take care of my father. Now, there was the obvious things, like the nursing home trips and the emergency room visits, those were a good time, uh, that I did as part of taking care of him. But another idea came to my mind, largely because of something my daughter had once said. She said, you know, Grandpa is just like Mulligan, our Bernice Mountain Dog. And I thought, really? She said, yeah, he just likes to go for the car ride. <laughs> but I realized she was right. I would look out the window, the dog would be in the car, my dad would be sitting in the car. He really did like to go for the ride. So I started taking my father for car rides. And this amazing thing happened. He started to tell me stories. Many of them were stories I had heard over and over and over again, but this time those stories were different. He started to open up and talk about some of his own experiences in a way that showed real reflection. Instead of using humor, he actually talked about his own confusion about why he behaved the way that he behaved. He acknowledged regret, specifically about the ways in which his behavior made his mother's life really difficult. And all of a sudden, as I spent all this time with him, I realized he does actually know a lot more than I thought he had. So one day, after I had finished recording his story sitting by his bedside, at this point he wasn't well enough to go for the car rides anymore. I got ready to leave and I paused in the doorway and I said, Dad, I love you. And I heard him say from his bed, you never know when it's gonna be the last time, do you, Sarah? And that gave me pause. I turned around and I sat back at the side of his bed and I said, no, Dad, I don't. I said, you know, Dad, I'm wondering, is there something that you need to do? Is there someone you need to see? Is there something that you are holding on for? And he looked at me and he said, time, with my family. And it was this very powerful moment that I realized that for all too many of us, we will not realize the value of our time as our most important currency until we're watching the hourglass run out. It was just a few weeks after that conversation that my father was moved to the nursing home where we knew he was going to pass away. And I was sitting beside him reflecting on how this is it. This time, I'm going to say goodbye to my dad, and it's going to be forever. And I realized, you know, even though most people would acknowledge she was a pretty lousy father, he was actually one of my best friends. So I said to him as I sat there holding his hand, Dad, do you know that you're one of my best friends? And he said, no. And I thought, he must not have heard me right. So I got up. And I moved over to his bed, and I leaned down, and I watched as his eyes tried to get focus on my face. And I said, Dad, you don't know that you're one of my best friends? And he said, no, I think you're angry at me. What do you do? Here I am. Do I look at a dying man and tell him that I'm angry at him? Do I lie to a dying man and tell him that I'm not? I'm forced to make this decision and I start to think back because I hadn't thought about this in a long time. And I'm almost instantly back in the car with him, listening to these stories, thinking about all the things I had realized about him, including that in some ways he and I really weren't that different, except that when I was struggling, my mom brought me to Boston Children's Hospital. My dad was sent to Catholic boarding schools. There was nobody to try to figure out why he was struggling. And so as I sat there and I looked at him, I actually realized something that I don't know if I would ever have realized had it not been for that comment. I actually wasn't angry at him anymore. 
And I looked at him and I said, Dad, no. I understand why you think that. I was angry for a long time. But I've realized something, Dad. I am who I am because of you, the good things and the bad things. I'm a wonderful storyteller, and I get that from you. And I'm brave, and I'm strong, and I get that because of you. So no, Dad, I'm not mad at you anymore. My father left us just a couple of days after that conversation. But I realized something. There's a lot of ways for us to take care of our souls, the essence of who we are as people, but one of the most powerful ones in my view is finding forgiveness. Forgiveness for my father allows me to remember him by this moment. This moment of him playing in the park with my daughter with the wood chips. Or to think back and smile how he used to take my kids for walks around the neighborhood and look for SpongeBob SquarePants in the storm drains. <laughs> Forgiveness allows me to not hold on to the hurt. It allows me to have compassion and freedom from all of those feelings. So I want to take you back to that day at Lonesome Lake. As I was coming down the mountain, if I'm being completely honest, I think I just needed a break. But I spotted this tree, and I thought it was really interesting looking. So I took a picture of it. At the time, it was nothing more than interesting. But when I started to think about this idea of soul exhaustion, and I went through all of the pictures from that day, I actually realized this, this picture means a lot more to me. That tree means a lot more to me. You see, so often we think about the hardships in our lives as things that we have to get over, as things that we try to get away from as unscathed as possible. But what if we thought about it as actually part of what makes us beautiful? In my mind, this tree is so resilient because it had the ability to grow over that boulder. It is unique, it is strong, and it is beautiful. So just to think about, one of the many ways that we can take care of our souls is working on forgiveness. There's three types of forgiveness that I think about. One is finding forgiveness for others. Two is asking for forgiveness when we have made a mistake or hurt somebody. And three is being able to forgive ourselves. Thank you so much.